my nick is uh, Angry Ant, and I'm here to talk about Unity, uh, Network Code, and you. Uh, this talk will be an overview of the network possibilities in Unity, and uh, combined with some tips and, tips and tricks on uh, how you can do that. Um, so all things networking, yes, all of them. Um, so I might be speed talking a bit. I'll try and keep that down a bit. but. Uh, I don't have a lot of slides. I have a lot of example code. So I'll kind of scale it to uh, see and fit uh, as much detail as possible. Um, but we'll see. Um, so I'll be covering the build-in networking. That is our RackNet-based solution with the network views and uh, network instantiating objects. Uh, then I'll be talking a bit about sockets, uh, which are also available in Unity and uh, a lot of the middleware. Um, that's available for networking uh, is based on these uh, .NET sockets. Um, then I'll be covering the W3 class uh, with its uh, forum version as well. And finally, I'll be talking about browser communication. Uh, so that's, that's the external JavaScript calls. Um, I kind of put it in here because that's kind of a best fit, and it's a natural uh, follow from the W3 class stuff. Uh, so first off, I'll uh, talk about the built-in networking. Um, and this stuff is kind of like uh, you, you want to choose the built-in networking when you want multi-user in your game, and you, don't want to, you want it to just work. And don't, don't worry about the nitty-gritty details of how much data is going where and when. Um, so it's uh, very useful for, uh, like, say you have a racing game or a first-person shooter or something like that. Uh, it, uh, it handles all of the communication. Um, client server setup. Um, you have these network views uh, that are a comp there are components that you attach to your game object. Uh, and they, they then have a target that it gets synchronized uh, over the network. Uh, so this target uh, can be a mono behavior or, uh, or a transform or a rigid body or whatever. Um, then you can instantiate these. Uh, so when you want to like, spawn an enemy or uh, create a new pickup, or whatever the case might be. Uh, there is a specific network.instantiate instead of the regular instantiate function, which works the same way, uh, except it also makes sure that uh, all the network traffic is set up. Um, then we also have the master server, uh, which is an optional uh, add-on to uh, the built-in networking. Uh, and this basically does game listing. Um, so you basically, it's basically just a big table of, uh, of hosted games. We provide a built-in one, or a default one, uh, which you can use for testing. Uh, but we also have the source available. Uh, so you can build your own and host it uh, wherever you want, because the uh, default one, of course, sees a lot of traffic. Um, but yeah, I mean, it has a list of, of uh, game types, uh, game rooms. Um, and uh, you can add uh, additional data to that. Uh, there's a, a comment uh, part of the, of the listing where uh, you can pretty easily just serialize. Uh, it's just a string. So you can just serialize whatever data into that. So you can have stuff like uh, uh, level name and game type and stuff like that. Um, so for synchronization, uh, if you if you have your target for your network view uh, set to a mono behavior, you have this callback called uh, unserialized network view. That provides you with a bit stream uh, that you can either read or write uh, from. Uh, and it, of course, supports the, the default built-in Unity types. Um, but in case you have a more uh, complex type, uh, you, you can basically just uh, write your own simple wrappers around that, say it's uh, I mean, we do support out of the box, of course, serializing a vector. But if we didn't, uh, then you just write your own, uh, which, which just serializes three floats. Uh, so it should cover uh, most of the types you want to serialize. Um, prediction is also fairly easy. Um, I'm going to show an example of that, uh, some very simple dead reckoning, um, where you, in case of uh, a network la latency, uh, you still get a sort of smooth uh, application of your, of your remote movement. Um, I think I'm moving a bit fast here. But uh, uh, RPCs are also supported by the network views. Uh, so it stands for remote procedure call. And that's basically a send message across, across the network. Uh, so like with the send message call, 
you uh, provide a string for the name and then a bunch of parameters. Uh, but it has a third uh, default parameter, um, which allows you to either send uh, a buffered RPC uh, or a direct RPC um, and to a specific player or to the server. So a buffered RPC is basically, uh, it basically pushes everything into a, a buffer on the server, uh, and that buffer is served to uh, any new clients connecting late. Uh, so buffered RPC is useful for something that changes the state of the world um, and, uh, and isn't serialized in, a, in any other way. Um, so, but uh, I mean, but it builds a buffer. So if you don't uh, need uh, that uh, that buffering, then uh, it's a good idea to just send a direct one. Um, yeah, there we go. Well, wait, bullet points. Um, I'll also talk a bit about faces. Uh, it's pretty easy to uh, to set up with the built-in stuff as well, um, and an easy setup that you most likely often want is a pre and post game setup uh, with the actual game in the middle. So you have like a waiting for player state, uh, collecting up data, maybe there's a, a built in chat room or something, and there's the actual game, and then there's like the score view at the end. Um, so I'll, I'll show that. There we go. Yes. This I will cover. Um, and then level loading, um, that is a bit more hairy. Uh, because you have um, you have these uh, network views that exist within the level and thus belong to the server. Um, basically, a network view has an owner, uh, and that owner is responsible for sending out like the the golden copy of of uh, the serialized data here. Um, and all the network views already present in the scenes being loaded are by default owned by the server. Uh, so when you do a level load, uh, you need to uh, clear the, the RPC buffer, um, and you need to uh, disable the sending of the, of the network views uh, that are in the scene uh, to clear that up and then increase uh, the, uh, the prefix, uh, which is available in the network API. Uh, so this basically is a prefix that in the back end of the networking is applied to all the network, uh, network view IDs. Uh, so you get a you get an easy distinction between which scene are these coming from. Um, so, yes, here we go. This is the fun bit. Uh, I have an example of the built-in stuff. Uh, and I should have had Unity open, which would have been great. Uh, let's see here. Mm. Bup, bup, bup. Done. Go. Yes. New version, yay. Um, OK, so I have a very simple level here uh, where I want to instantiate a character uh, to uh, move around a bit, uh, controlled by the server, uh, but directed by the client. So what I mean here is the, the server has the authority to have the golden copy of, uh, of the movement of this character, um, but it's taking directions from the player. So this way, it's called an authoritative server. Um, and this way, you can make sure that uh, you don't have clients doing uh, uh, where players are sending like funky network traffic to run faster or other, other hacks. Um, so uh, maybe I should just start by showing the end result. That's always fun. So I did a bit of uh, editor scripting because I can't not do that. Uh, and of course. This works terrible in this resolution. Amazing. Uh, let's just quickly go into player settings here. Oh, wait. I'll hold Alt. Do it. No. No. Fuck. It's amazing. Uh, project settings, player. So a bit of a UI tutorial here, of course. Uh, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Enabled, yes, please. Let's dial it down to this. Go, awesome, OK. So I have a bit of UI here to uh, control which state uh, my server is running in. Um, 
And uh, right now it's in the pregame state, so any client that joins will be told to wait until it gets the go ahead from the server. So uh, we can either join a client here. So now it's, it's uh, connected to the server. It received the pregame notification. Um, and you can say uh, the server has, has uh, noticed that this client has joined and is now in the queue to actually go in. So let's just shift to the game state here. And we should see we have an instantiation here. And we can move this guy around. And it's got very simple prediction where he actually overshoots all the time. But I considered doing a bit of a more smooth thing, but uh, I wanted to keep the example simple. But um, so this is, uh, I'm sending uh, the movement f uh, information from the client to the server, and the client then implements that and sends the position updates back. Um, so uh, let's join in uh, the source and uh, see how this uh, goes on. Oh, I didn't show the, OK, fuck it. I'll uh, show the pr uh, post game state here. Yay, done. And then we're in the post game mode, and we can rejoin, going into the queue, waiting for the game to start. And the game can then go, well, now we're in pregame, so you know, it'll take a while. And then go back into the game and get the instantiation. Um, yeah, but let's see the source. That's the funny part. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Built in. Yes. Big font. Everything can be seen. That's great. Um, so this is a central control script uh, that runs everything. And uh, I start off by I register my uh, lock callback so I can see in the UI what's going on. It's, quite nice for debugging, uh, especially in network code where you have one instance running in, in play mode and the rest are uh, in clients. Uh, so this log handler can either go to your UI or it can go to a different log file. I mean, in this case, I'm just setting um, a message string, uh, which I'm then displaying in, uh, in the GUI. Um, but we do that first in case anything bad happens and we want to see it. Uh, then I'm just going over my command line arguments, checking if one of them is the server argument, which I have to find here, server. Um, and if it's the server, I'm initializing my server, setting up some security. Uh, this security basically uh, does uh, some encryption of the traffic going on. Uh, so it help, it uh, protects against like very uh, straightforward just packet sniffing and changing stuff around. Uh, it provides some uh, rudimentary protection against that. Um, so we call initialize server, and that gives us this pretty callback once we're done. Um, locks it out, and then send a message to our game object because I implemented that elsewhere. Um, otherwise, we connect to our IP. So in this instance, we're actually not using the master server at all. Um, it's an add-on we could have chose to use, but uh, it's uh, not required. Um, so we connect to our own IP, which is this link lovely thing. Um, and that gives us the unconnected to server callback, which then sends a different message. Um, so let's just see how I implement those. Uh, server, there we go. Server is the fun part. Um, actually, we were looking at the client, so let's look at that. It's also the short one. Yes, OK. So uh, this is the on-client start call we got. So we get this as soon as we have connected and everything's set up. Uh, we then assume we're in the pre-game uh, state, and we send the RPC uh, on client request join to our server specifically. So you see this is the, uh, the RPC function I was talking about earlier, uh, looking just like the send message. It's just a remote one. And we send this just to the server, because uh, there's no reason to ask the other clients for approval. Um, the server will then send join accepted back, um, which pushes us into the game state. Um, and we have some other code that uh, 
that says, yay, okay, let's do this. Um, and finally, the uh, server can send the uh, on post game RPC. So this is, this is the syntax for marking a method as an uh, RPC recipient. Um, so unlike, uh, unlike the send message functions uh, receivers, uh, you have to explicitly mark them uh, for RPCs. Uh, so that pushes us into the post game state. Um, and let's see. That's where we set it. OK, so once we're in this state, we can have the client. Do, 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 do. Oh, I forgot the name of that one. Uh, player. Here we go. Player script. Give it. No? OK. So this is the simple player script um, where it gets the, uh, the server sends. When it started, it goes through our states here. We have a pregame until we don't. Then when we're in the game state, we're telling all the players in the join queue, those are the players that have connected and requested to join, which we do here. Uh, if we're in the game state, we just go in. Otherwise, they go into the join queue. Um, so when we move into the game state, everyone in the queue gets accepted in, and we clear the queue up. Um, we remain there until we go into post game. Uh, we send that to everyone and uh, clean up any instantiations that have been done. Um, so accept players. Uh, that's the one we call when we accept the player up uh, when we went into the game state. Uh, it sends the RPC back to the player saying, you're good to go, and then instantiates uh, our player prefab here. Um, so since it's the server that instantiates it, the server controls all the network views there. Um, and that means the only way that the actual player can communicate with, um, with its instance is by sending RPCs. Um, so we call spawn on the instance uh, over here. Um, so that lets that just set some a local logic up to say, I am the server, I control this. Um, and uh, sets up the camera. Oh, no, wait. There we go. There we go. Ah. Uh, it says, since the, sets the player owner, uh, which is the one that is allowed to control, um, and sends the RPC to that player specifically. Uh, so that gives the server an overview of who is actually in control of this network view. And it tells that specific uh, player that you're good to go. Um, so I think I'm gone into a lot of detail on this example, uh, but let's hurry it a little bit. Um, so if this is mine player, uh, then we check out what the vertical and horizontal input is, uh, push that into our uh, move direction enum here, going north, south, east, west, and in between. So here we go. Um, and uh, if that has changed, we send on navigate back to the player uh, instance on the server. So this tells the server the client controlling this uh, network view wants it moved. Uh, so the, the client doesn't move, uh, move the player on its own. Um, oh. OK, so fixed update. If we're server, we've received uh, this move direction, and we can use that to create a target velocity uh, that we then add as a force, so it's a rigid body-based uh, character. Um, and we do a bit of prediction uh, each, each update call, and when we receive um, a serialization. So uh, that basically just does simple debt reckoning uh, that uses our target velo velocity uh, minus our drag and uh, goes like predicts our position in, uh, in the future based on the time argument given, which is either delta time in update or uh, the, um, 
the time it has taken to serialize uh, the synchronization network package. Um, OK, I think I'll have to move on from here. Uh, but all of the example code will be available after the talk as well, um, when the video is up. I'm not really sure when that is. Um, so lots of examples. Let's jump back in here. Next up, I'll talk about sockets. Um, so sockets are these, uh, usually you'll, that's as low as you'll get to, close as you'll get to the middle. Um, and when you host, you go through this uh, setup of uh, initially creating the socket, binding it to a specific port, listening for connections, accepting those connections, and then you have a socket connection going with the client. Whereas the client just goes connect and done. Um, uh, for uh, transmitting, you can do uh, async uh, operations. And uh, basically, this socket implementation is straight out of the .NET libraries. So there are a lot of examples online. Um, and, uh, and one good use for sockets uh, compared to the built-in networking could be if you want to stream something like a, uh, a camera feed or something uh, data heavy where you don't want, uh, you want to be complete in complete control of uh, what data goes over the network. Um, and, um, and you don't want to have uh, boxing that, you, uh, that you're not aware of. So uh, one point about sockets is that uh, in the web player we have a security layer uh, that basically prevents uh, port listening at all. Um, the reason for this is the web player is running on the client machine, so you could, uh, without this, potentially have a malicious uh, web player which uh, tries to uh, appear as, an, as another service for that, uh, for that client. Um, so, no listening. And if you need to do outgoing connections to a different domain, uh, then you need a, a cross-domain policy, uh, which is this uh, simple uh, server that's running on a specific port, uh, which you can get the source code for. Um, but basically, what it, what it means is you have to be in control of the server that you do a socket to. Um, so, usually, not a problem. Uh, and of course, built-in networking, uh, since we're in control of it, uh, it's exempted from uh, this networking policy, so you can host uh, games with the built-in stuff from a web player just fine. Um, and more information on this URL. The Google part is uh, Security Sandbox. You'll find it right there. Um, and a brief example. Let's see here. Um, let's have the project first. Sockets. Mm, jump around. OK, so I have the same little bit of editor scripting to launch my server. Um, so now I have a server running. Uh, it's hosting on the specified port and waiting for connections. So we can launch a client here with the secret handshake. And we're all connected up and happy. There we go. Connected. Great. We can launch one from play mode. And everyone receives. Great. OK. Very simple example. Um, but uh, let's go into the details of it. Oh, boom, boom, boom. Bing. Way. Interesting. Uh, whoop. Here we go. So, same as uh, what's it? Here we go. Same as before. I have this uh, central con control script attached to my main camera, um, which uh, which first checks if this is a server instance. Uh, if so, goes through the host uh, setup. Otherwise, connects to our current IP. And once that is done, it sends a message to confirm it, which uh, can be handled by uh, a different script. Um, 
So the host bit, we basically, as I showed uh, before, go through the bind and listen uh, setup before we start accepting. Uh, and the begin accept um, call gives you an opportunity to have an async callback so you don't have to block your main thread. Um, and there we go. And client connect. You get the callback and say, OK, that's great. Uh, let's send out a message with the socket that has been created between the server and the client. Um, otherwise, go nuts and start accepting again. Um, and the client, very straightforward, create the socket, connect to the endpoint end point of the IP we're uh, uh, targeting and uh, the port we want to connect to. And uh, as long as it's connected, that's all gravy, and we continue. Otherwise, we go a bit crazy and return false. Um, so client control. Um, this is where we get in from the send message we got from control. Uh, go, yay, and then assign the socket and begin reading. Uh, so again, this is, well, actually, this is a bit of a encapsulated class I'm doing. So I can read. Um, so uh, here we go. I call begin uh, with a, a read handler and an error handler, uh, which creates a new instance of this class uh, that stores the socket and the handlers and call this uh, async begin receive call. Uh, and it works pretty much exactly like the accept call. We get a callback with an async result, um, read up the bytes. There might be multiple calls. Right here, I just, uh, I assume, I just get one package that is, the, uh, that is smaller than the maximum size of my buffer, just for uh, simplicity. Um, and then we begin another one, and we call back the delegate that we got passed uh, to handle the read. Otherwise, we call the error handler. Uh, so in client control, the two delegates we use here is on receive and on error. Uh, and receive basically just ASCII decodes the byte data, shows it in the lock, which will show it on the UI because I did the same lock uh, callback. Um, and on error, it does a log error, and that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, let's see, did we go server control? How are we for time? Oh, we're terrible, okay. Um, let's see, so we started here, and we get a callback from uh, client connect from the control over here, where we did, do, 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 do. There we go. Send this message, gets picked up by the server control, which adds it to our pretty list of clients here and begin reading just like with the client. So, I mean, it's just a socket that is just like a pipe between uh, two points. Um, so the API is the same whether you are a server or a client. Um, then when we once we receive the callback from our socket read uh, handler here, um, we get the byte data, and just like a client, we display it out, uh, ASCII decoded, um, and then we go through all our clients, and if it's the one that just, um, that just sent us this message, then we ignore that one. Otherwise, we send the ASCII encoded message to that, uh, that specific client. So we spread it out to other clients, and the the sender only communicates with the server. Um, OK, yeah, I think that is it for here. Let's quickly jump on to next point. Oh, that was the print. Yay. OK, so next up is the W3 class and its form counterpart. Um, this is uh, basically the HTTP we all know and love from late 80s um, or whenever it came up. I am no historian. Uh, but uh, let's start off with the web player security point because 
we've just been there. Uh, so if you need to do an HTTP call to a different uh, domain than the one you're currently on, uh, you'll um, oh, hey. um, you'll need to have a cross-domain policy. Uh, but uh, this is a very common standard. It's uh, widely used by the Flash player, for instance. Uh, so many of uh, like high score sites and stuff like that will already have a, a policy in place. Um, and again, that's the URL and that's the highlighted Google term, um, the security sandbox. Anyway, um, the W3 class is just the HTTP protocol. Uh, it lets you load images, uh, audio, video, streaming, um, asset bundles is built in. Um, so this is your primary way to have a distributed, um, distributed build that you then assemble uh, during runtime. And it can also have like whatever arbitrary data, like maybe assembly data, uh, that you then use in your, uh, in your product. Um, Similarly, uh, the W3 form class allows you to do a, an HTTP POST call, uh, providing uh, encoded binary data or simple form data as you know it from uh, HTML. Um, and uh, let me just show you an example of that. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Mm, there we go. Um, Yes, I'll show the code first on this one, because that's fun. Um, we do the register log callback, very useful. Um, and then ba -bum, we have some GUI here, uh, which starts a coroutine load assembly. Um, and that starts a new W3 call, uh, creates a new W3 instance, targeting uh, the URL of assembly.dll. So it assumes that right next to this web player, at least URL-wise, is assembly.dll. I then yield return to this instance, which basically uh, it just yields a coroutine until it's done, uh, either with an error or it has the content that you requested. Um, so this is very useful for um, um, having maybe multiple W3 requests um, running in a queue, for instance. Oh, um, then we tell our great success story here, and we load the uh, assembly from the bytes uh, that were uh, received with the W3 call. And go, yay, we did that. Um, and once we have that, our GUI lets us go, well, OK, then we can start this coroutine. Uh, which is up here. And it goes, no thank you, if it has no assembly. Uh, otherwise, since this is an assembly, we can, it's already been loaded into memory, so we can get our type myAssembly and the static method on that and invoke it with no instance and no parameters. And that gives us a nice W3 uh, class uh, instance which we can yield to and go, yay, we uploaded it. So this is a bit abstract, but let's um, go in deeper. Uh, let's see, txt, yes, there we go. This is myassembly.cs.txt. Uh, it's because I have a bit of an editor script uh, that compiles this automatically to assembly, uh, so I don't want it compiled by uh, the regular Unity compiler, so I just put .txt here. Um, but yeah, as you can see, it has that static method upload screenshot that we invoked uh, from over here. Um, and it locks out, yay, we're going, and then creates a new texture to hold the screen size, reads the, the pixel from the screen, and applies it to a texture. Then here's the W3 related bit, um, which creates a new W3 form uh, instance add the field, form field file with our binary data uh, of the texture in PNG form. We call that screenshot.png and provide the type of the data for the, for the form. And then we just return a new W3 instance to the URL we have up here, which is our lovely upload script, and provide the form data that we've just created here. 
Um, so this displays uh, two forms of, uh, of using the W3 class and some lovely assembly juggling, because that's fun. Um, and yeah, and this is the, so this is the W3 instance we get back, returned here. Get that back uh, from our call through the assembly. Yield to that and go, yeah, it's up. OK, and in the end, we, this request will actually output some, some text, which we then display. Uh, so let's just take all this abstractness and actually show it. Um, boom, 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 boom. Go. Go. Do it. Now. No? Oh, lovely. Really? No, oh, there we go. So I'll just check I have my server running. Yes, yes, that's all good. And boop. Poof, you do not exist. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll build this web player. And boom, boom, boom. I'll put it right here because that is an excellent spot. And here we go. Um, and I have this uh, editor script which has taken my uh, C sharp script and built that to this assembly, uh, which is inside my web player template, meaning it gets included when I do my uh, web player build. So if we check it out here, there's my assembly. And to run it, go. Please work. Uh, uh, mm. Yes? Yes. OK. So loading all the way from my hard drive. Come on. Yes. OK. So as it has no uh, assembly reference right now, it displays the load button, which Load it, yay. And then we do a screenshot. Click. And this is the URL of the screenshot, which happens to be here. Yay. It works. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And uh, all this goodness will be available with the talk video and stuff. So you can play around with it later. OK, how am I for time? Yeah, OK. Ended up speed talking more than I thought. Yeah, well. OK, so finally, it's a external J JavaScript. So this is where you can do all your crazy web designer things and uh, integrate well with the website. Uh, so the API for this is, is application.external call or external eval. That, that allows you to execute code um, in, in the JavaScript environment of the website that your um, web player is running in. So that could be uh, that you have the website, the HTML set up with some JavaScript linked in or put in the, in the HTML source uh, with defining some functions that you invoke directly. Or you could have all of the source for the JavaScript actually embedded in the web player and just evaluate that in the JavaScript runtime. Um, and of course, JavaScript can do a send message back to Unity. So if you have a process that takes a while, uh, or you want to have maybe um, some, some controls on the website that affect the runtime of the player, uh, this uh, send message uh, setup is uh, what you want. Um, and of course, we, are, we actually have similar APIs on both iOS and Android. Uh, where you can call out into Java code, or you can call out into um, uh, to like your iOS uh, parent application. Um, so I'll just jump straight into an example here, because we're that crazy. Um, away and external JS, yes. Uh, dun, 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 dun. But this time we start in the player. Uh, over here. There 
Yes. I've cheated a bit and built it already. Uh, I hope. Here we go. So this web player is loaded in the default web player template. So it's just a white uh, HTML page with, um, with the web player in it. But then it did the funky thing there. Um, because it actually took and rewrote the HTML hosting the web player. So now we're actually in a frame set um, using the same HTML file. So we can click this lovely button and scale up a small hidden frame up here. And using that, we can take an awesome photo from our desktop. That's good. Yes. Upload that. Poof. So what we saw here was first the web player rebuilt itself, uh, rebuilt, rebuilt the HTML around it. Then it did an external JavaScript call out to uh, resize the frame. Um, and then once that frame had been submitted, the, uh, the PHP returned some JavaScript that called back into the web player to hide the frame and uh, tell the web player about the location of the, of the upload. So let's check out the source for this. Uh, this is still in, yes, OK. So what I have here is uh, I have uh, my control script with uh, two public text asset types. Uh, there's my init script, which does the rebuilding. And then there's the upload page source, which is what I want to write into uh, the small data frame uh, to show that upload uh, lovely HTML. Um, <clears throat> so. Let's see here. Uh, maybe we can take a look at how it looks in Unity. Mm, this is the wrong example. Yay. Uh, external JS. Go. Faster this time, yeah? Yes. OK. So I have my public control uh, script here. And it's populated with these two uh, TXT files, which hold my, my scripting. So let's just take a look at that. Mm. TXT. Do, 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 do. This is the init script. OK. So this is the script, the JavaScript I, I evaluate in the beginning, um, where if this frame is the top or if the parent frame doesn't hold our callback frame, which is the small one we use to, to show the upload HTML, if that's not the case, then actually let's just rewrite this whole thing. Um, so brand new HTML uh, with a frame set, uh, of course, loading, uh, boop, 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 boop. here we go, of course, loading this HTML file back. So our web player gets included in this, um, in this framework, uh, frame set. And then we create this callback frame just going nowhere and not resizable, no frame, no nothing, and zero pixels. And so when we get loaded again in this frame set, this, will, uh, this check will fail. So we are no longer the top frame. And the callback frame is present. So then we just call get unity that send message to say, OK, con the control uh, game object needs the message unloaded because we're all good to go here. So. Um, so here I do application.external eval using that source text um, of my init script. And do, 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 where are we on loaded? Yes. Uh, so then we set we're all good with our callback frame. And that Boolean is used in our GUI uh, to enable or disable it and allow that we can first clear the frame. Uh, the small data frame, and then right into that frame, we write the, the page source uh, of, uh, of our upload page, which we can just check out here. Poof. Uh, very simple little thing with uh, it, has, it has a cancel functionality, which can call back into the web player and say, just hide the frame. Um, and then clear, clear out. Uh, or there's the submit handler on the form, mm, here, uh, which tells the web player that 
we have now submitted the form, and you can expect uh, to receive a call back. Uh, bum, 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 bum. And OK, so let's check a look at the right frame bit. Um, so this does the external eval of calling document.write in our callback frame and providing um, the escaped version of the content uh, given. Uh, so that means I don't have to uh, take this upload source and put it into one line and crazy escape all my lines and everything, um, all my uh, quotes. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. Um, and the clear frame just goes back to about blank for the um, for the data frame. Um, yeah, hide and show frame sets the the width of uh, of that data frame to either 50 or zero, depending on what whether we were to show it or not. Yeah. Show. Um, boom. I think that's it for that example, although it was fun. Oh, print again. More people need to implement command P for play. It's a nice thing. OK, so that's actually the end of the talk. Um, and I'm um, ready for questions. Oh, there's one over here. Hi. Hey. Um, is there a performance difference between uh, an RPC and serializing? And serializing? Well, um, I mean, the, the serializing has been built in to send at a specific frame rate. So uh, if you send an RPC, at the same frame rate, that is going to send more data, uh, and it's not going to be yeah, it's not going to be as, as optimal. Um, so, one thing that uh, that I actually often see is people serialize too much data, uh, where they, they serialize some data that really rarely changes, uh, where it's it you can get a lot more out of just serializing uh, the data that changes rapidly, and then sending RPC events when you get a change in something that doesn't change as often. Uh, but using the RPC to replace the serialization pipeline, that will give you a bottleneck, yeah. Because I saw some authoritative uh, server examples which, um, you know, you send a message to the server and then the server sends an RPC and that, that's actually serializing an RPC. Hmm. So I was wondering if that would slow down uh, yeah, yeah, performance. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, serializing, serializing through the unserialized network view, that is the fastest way to get uh, a lot of data across. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, do you know if there are any plans to let you set the headers or have more control over the HTTP methods in W3 form? Yeah, that's a popular request. Um, well, uh, I don't know if we have any plans right now, but it's something we're aware of, and we want to do something about it, but we have no announcements or anything. So um, yeah, it's, it's especially with everyone doing REST and that stuff, I guess that's the use. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, we want to do it. We have no nothing to announce yet, but uh, we're aware of it. Yeah. OK, thanks. Yeah. Um, so, w with regard to sending physics across the network using the standard synchronizing thing, mm -hmm. um, we've in the past had some minor issues where even if we're doing interpolating, you still get big sort of jumps in the physics. Um, especially while, while sending automatically uh, rigid bodies across the network. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would recommend when doing rigid bodies that you uh, you do it the way I did with uh, with using unserialized uh, network view. So you then serialize the velocity and the position, um, and then you do your own prediction on that. Um, and I mean, you did you saw that the the prediction was actually like overshooting often uh, because it was just very simple. Um, but I would usually take care of that in animation. 
um, that's what I've done in the past, just hide it a bit and I'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's pretty much our current solution. I was just wondering if there's any any plans for anything more, uh, sort of like maybe some built-in dead reckoning type algorithms or. Any yeah, uh, I mean there'll be more examples on networking, uh, which will show uh, a character running uh, and animating smoothly and stuff across the network. Um, so through that, yes, and some of that will actually be in standard assets. Um, so yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Hi, uh, I was wondering if there's any plans on uh, improving the or updating the, the network uh, capabilities because first of all there's stuff that RackNet uh, allows like voice is the thing that comes to mind first that you guys don't, don't, don't implement mm. and also as the Unity starts becoming more complex it would be nice to have something like an avatar or something that, because you have like that character controller that has been hanging around for a while. I know, yeah. And it would be nice to have something that already, you know, you plug it in or you drag a script to it and it has prediction and it's networked and it's, uh, the animation just works because with all these systems, it's, it's starting to become very complex and like it's, mm -hmm. it's starting to become a, a you have to do very low level stuff in the network. Mm. So plans on improving that? Uh, yeah, well, that's a great idea. And uh, we do have a new character controller coming in 4.0. So uh, it's, it's not in the demo package right now, uh, but it's going to be in standard assets and more or less replace the current uh, uh, character controller. And it'll have the, some simple debt reckoning, and it'll be ready to run on uh, nav mesh and uh, rigid body or transform based and work well with mechanism as well. Um, with regards to adding more to the feature set from RackNet, um, we are aware that uh, we haven't really upgraded much in the networking department uh, for a long time now. Um, but we are actually uh, staffing up and adding resources to this problem. Um, no promises yet, though. Um, but yeah. Hmm? Hi, thanks for the talk. Okay. I have a small question about one of the slides. You said you encrypt stuff yeah. before sending. Yeah. And I remember when I published a game for iOS, I have to have a checkbox if I use encryption technology, which I export from US to other countries. Does that imply that I have to use that checkbox? Or do you know by chance how Oof. that point is? Do you know, like? No? no. Sorry. Uh, try and come to the hands-on labs. Maybe we can find an answer for you. Uh, okay, I'm not thanks. sure how the policy works there. Um, yeah. Thanks, anyway. <laughs> um, about the update you plan for the networking code, um, do you follow the guys of Much Difference, which uh, developed the uh, Ulink plugin, mm -hmm. which uh, kind of rewrote the networking code and uh, added uh, really nice features for uh, lightweight servers and stuff like that. Do you mm -hmm. plan to integrate this kind of feature? Um, I mean, OK, so without getting into too much trouble, um, we, uh, we want to do, want to support a high-level API, uh, but at the same time avoid uh, taking away the power of having the nitty-gritty stuff available. So a low-level API as well. But um, the exact details of how abstract and how much we add in, uh, we exactly don't know yet. So we're, we're working on it, and we have grand plans. But how much of that ends up in product, it's uh, not determined yet. But nothing planned for Unity 4? Not 4, oh, no. OK. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned using the W3 class for downloading asset bundles. That's mm -hmm. what we do yeah. in our mobile apps. But for mobile, it's not very uncommon to lose the connection. Now, the problem we have is that W3 class takes a lot of time to recognize that the connection has broken. And oh. sometimes it doesn't yield at all. OK. Any. I mean, looks like the default timeout is like a minute. So someone 
losing his connection would, would, only would, find would out wait after. on a loading screen for a minute, effectively. Yeah. Is okay. There... Uh, that sounds like a pretty straightforward bug report. Uh, I mean, we should not be doing that. Um, but yeah, I don't know iOS specifically or uh, Android specifically. It's uh, iOS. Yeah, I, I don't know. I would uh, actually. Could you bug report it and then bring it to the the mobile table? Uh, that would be good, so we can get some like straight eyes on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this actually is more of an asset bundles thing, but um, uh -oh. you can download asset bundles using the, the web form mm -hmm. approach. Is there any approach that you can use to, like, without using an asset bundle, could you possibly download Unity assets in some other form? Like, I know you can use textures, but is it possible to get a mesh down without creating a dynamic mesh? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, in the example, I was uh, I was taking code that was in my assets, building that to an assembly, and then loading that down. Uh, so in the same way, you could uh, uh, actually I can just show you real quick here. Um, the example is this is the JavaScript one. Let's move to boom, boom, boom. This one. Okay. Uh, what do they call it? Assembly builder. OK. So this is actually just a post processor. Uh, so whenever uh, something changes in this path and it has this extension, I <coughs> sorry, I, uh, I build that into an assembly using the, the built in uh, .NET compiler. Uh, so in the same way, using the same method, you could uh, have an asset post processor checking for meshes, and then baking that into some other data format, like maybe just raw uh, vertices and, um, and uh, oh. yeah, I mean, just the raw data. Uh, and then at runtime, recreate that in a new mesh, dynamically create it. Um, so that's, that's one way around it. Uh, but I mean, asset bundles is the most handy way, because it's, it's just directly exported. Uh, but yeah. Awesome. Thanks. And this example, you're loading an assembly mm -hmm. which you are loaded from the web. Yeah. Would that work on iOS? Uh, no, it won't, unfortunately, because uh, iOS doesn't allow execution. I mean, just from the license, it wouldn't work because they don't allow execution of arbitrary code. Yeah, that was um, because why I asked. <laughs> yeah, uh, and also because of that, we. Uh, we don't have a just-in-time compilation running at all. Uh, we only compile ahead of time. Uh, so it's also technically not uh, feasible, um, unless we add that, which would be kind of odd, because it would directly violate uh, the terms. Yeah. OK, thanks. Hey. Is it also possible to um, uh, save and download terrain data? Hmm. Uh, I mean, you can use you can use uh, get and set heights. Uh, so through that, you could do it. But the splat map uh, is, as far as I remember, not uh, get settable. Um, so some uh, partly, <laughs> partially. Yeah, I know there is uh, the. Um, um, so uh, resource loads, and you can uh, create. There's a terrain data uh, or terrain create yeah. method. Mm. Yeah, I guess you could export a package. Maybe it would be quite convoluted, but it might be a viable route to go if you could put something into resources there. Uh, but it also would depend on the platform. Um, yeah, well, it's just Windows, but um, yeah. I I tried it, but um, when I Download the terrain data from the uh, from a URL mm -hmm. from the internet. Uh, it won't uh, recognize all the terrain data like uh, trees and uh, textures. Yeah, I mean, it's basically there's a discrepancy between the data format when it's an asset 
and when it's built in, uh, like at, at runtime. Uh, so maybe you could pull it out of an asset bundle somehow. But yeah, I mean, it, asset bundles would be the best way to do it, really. Otherwise, it would be a bit of a hack, but it could be fun. <laughs> All right, thank you. Hmm? Oh, OK. Well, um, no more questions, uh, because we're out of time. Uh, but a bit of a service announcement. Uh, at the party, the awesome party this evening, please bring your uh, badges like this, because otherwise you will not be let in. Doesn't matter how much you cry, unfortunately. But uh, you don't want to miss this party, so bring your badges. Thanks. <laughs>